Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Impressed. Chapter 3 Freire re-emphasizes the importance of dialogue and praxis, the reflection and action process, which seeks to transform reality. He distinguishes between true and unauthentic words, stating, when a word is deprived of its dimension of action, reflection automatically suffers as well, and the word is changed into idle chatter, into verbalism, into an alienated and alienating blah. It becomes an empty word, one which cannot denounce the world, for denunciation is impossible without a commitment to transform, and there is no transformation without action. Ferry also warns, if action is emphasized exclusively to the detriment of reflection, the word is converted into activism. The latter, action for action's sake, negates the true praxis and makes dialogue impossible. Naming the world is necessary for humans to exist. And the purpose of naming the world is in order to change or transform it. For Freire, Speaking the true word, which is work, which is praxis, is to transform the world. Saying that word is not privilege of few persons, but the right for everyone. Furry states, consequently, no one can say a true word alone, or can she say it for another in a prescriptive act which robs others of their words. Dialogue is thus an existential necessity. Freire says, if it is in speaking their word that people, by naming the world, transform it, dialogue imposes itself as the way by which they achieve significance as human beings. Dialogue cannot occur between those who want to name the world and those who do not wish this naming, between those who deny others the right to speak their word and those whose right to speak has been denied them, he says. Ferry says that dialogue between people cannot be reduced to the act of one person's depositing ideas in another. He continues, stating that dialogue cannot be reduced to a simple exchange of ideas to be consumed by the discussants, nor yet is it a hostile, polemical argument between those who are committed neither to the naming of the world nor to the search for truth, but rather to the imposition of their own truth. Ferry claims that authentic or true dialogue between people cannot exist in the absence of profound love for the world and for the people, because love is an act of courage, not fear. Love is commitment to others, and this is dialogical. In the footnote on this page, Ferry states that true revolutionaries should view the revolution because of its creative and liberating nature as an act of love. In this description, Freire says, the distortion imposed on the word love by the capitalist world cannot prevent the revolution from being essentially loving in character, nor can it prevent the revolutionaries from affirming their love of life. He cites Che Guevara's statement that a true revolutionary is guided by strong feelings of love. Perhaps the important point to make here is that Ferry seeks to emphasize Guevara's involvement as a revolutionary in general, and not his history and activities leading up to and following the Cuban Revolution. Ferry instead focuses on Guevara's status as an international figure associated with that of a revolutionary inspired by Marxism and communism. Of course, there is more to Guevara than Ferry presents in this footnote and I highly suggest learning more about him in order to understand his views and exploits as a revolutionary, particularly leading up to and following the Cuban Revolution. Ferry states, as an act of bravery, love cannot be sentimental. As an act of freedom, it must not serve as a pretext for manipulation. He continues by describing how humility is a key feature for authentic dialogue to happen between people. In order to achieve this kind of dialogue, though, 
People cannot give in to in-group preferences or feel as if they are superior to the great unwashed. Ferry says, self-sufficiency is incompatible with dialogue. A statement such as this falls into line with Ferry's adherence to Marx's ideology and an adherence or belief in collectivist effort. In this sense, he continues with the idea that there are only people who are attempting, together, to learn more than they now know. Ferry claims, faith in people is an a priori requirement for dialogue. The dialogical man believes in others even before he meets them face to face. The dialogical man needs an intense faith in humankind, faith in their power to make and remake, to create and recreate, faith in their vocation to be more fully human. This faith in the dialogical man is necessary in recreating the world where emancipated labor supersedes slave labor, according to Freire. He says, founding itself upon love, humility, and faith, dialogue becomes a horizontal relationship of which mutual trust between the dialogues is a logical consequence. Freire also states that in order to establish authentic dialogue, Hope, which is rooted in men's incompletion, must exist where people seek to become complete human beings through communication with others. And the importance of critical thinking in establishing true dialogue. Ferry describes critical thinking as thinking which discerns an indivisible solidarity between the world and the people and admits of no dichotomy between them. Thinking which perceives reality as process, as transformation, rather than as a static entity. Thinking which does not separate itself from action, but constantly immerses itself in temporality without fear of the risks of being involved. Drawing a clear distinction between critical and naive thinking, Ferry states that those that employ naive thinking only seek to be concerned with holding on to a guaranteed space and adjust to it. In this sense, naive thinking provides a kind of security that maintains the status quo, which does not seek to rock the boat in order to transform reality. Ferry says that critical thinking is a key component of dialogue, and without communication there can be no true education. He returns to the notion of the banking model of education he introduced in Chapter 2. Contrasting the anti-dialogical banking educator with that of the dialogical problem-posing teacher-student. The anti-dialogical banking educator organizes his own design and poses his own question to answer. The dialogical problem-posing teacher-student approaches the content individuals want to know more about. An important thing to mention here is in Frary's note on the dialogical problem-posing teacher-student where he states, citing from André Malraux's text, Anti-Memoirs, Mao Zedong's comment about teaching the masses clearly what we have received from them confusedly. Mao Zedong, heavily influenced by Marxism, helped to create the Communist Party in China, which also shows Freire's alignment with Marxist philosophy. Essentially, Freire is suggesting that in Tong's statement, is the driving force behind dialogical theory in creating curriculum, program content, which should stem from the students, not the educator. Authentic education employs authentic humanism, which Pierre Furter, a French education theorist, says consists in permitting the emergence of the awareness of our full humanity as a condition and as an obligation, as a situation and as a project. Ferry states, for the truly humanist educator and the authentic revolutionary, the object of action is the reality to be transformed by them together with other people, not other men and women themselves. The oppressors are concerned with indoctrinating the masses into a system that best suits the oppressor's desires. Thus, the curriculum, or the program content, must come from the top down. 
Once again, Ferry cites Biosatone's philosophy on how to best educate the masses, which is based on focusing on their own interests and waiting until they are ready for that change, transformation, to come. He continues discussing how the oppressors exert their control over the masses through the rhetoric imbued in their slogans. However, Ferry points out that the oppressor class only provides the masses with a banking system of education that seeks to indoctrinate them into buying into their slogans and not one that provides them with heuristics in which they can compare them with the slogans presented by true revolutionary leaders. He emphasizes the starting point for organizing the program content of education or political action must be the present, existential, concrete situation, reflecting the aspirations of the people. Ferry contests that the educator and politician must understand and approach the people in their circumstances, not through alienated and alienating rhetoric. The investigation of what I have termed the people's thematic universe, the complex of their generative themes, inaugurates the dialogue of education as the practice of freedom, Ferry claims. He describes generative theme as neither an arbitrary invention nor a working hypothesis to be proved. So it is man's ability, as uncompleted beings, to reflect on their existence, their being in the world, making them historical, setting them apart from animals, which are not able to set objectives nor infuse their transformation of nature with any significance beyond itself. Man is a conscious being, aware of his actions in and upon the world. Humans can separate themselves from the world, which they objectify, as they separate themselves from their own activity, as they locate the seat of their decisions in themselves and in their relations with the world and others. People overcome the situations which limit them, the limit situations, described as the frontier which separates being from being more. When people view these limit situations as obstacles to be overcome, they engage in limit acts. And through critical perception of their limit situations, a climate of hope and confidence develops which leads men to attempt to overcome them. Separating humans from animals once again, Furry states, only human beings are praxis the praxis which, as the reflection and action which truly transform reality, is the source of knowledge and creation. He continues describing humans' interaction with the world and one another as epical units that is characterized by a complex of ideas, concepts, hopes, doubts, values, and challenges in dialectical interaction with their opposites, striving towards plenitude. Furry returns to the notion of themes, claiming that historical themes are not isolated, but rather connected and interacting dialectically with their opposites. The complex of interacting themes of an epoch constitutes its thematic universe, Ferry states. He continues how themes might become mythicized, establishing a climate of irrationality and sectarianism as resentment between the various themes develop among the people, thereby weakening the importance of the dynamic aspect of them in the people's struggle. In a sense, the themes that Ferry describes are created and shaped by the people that describe their struggle in their own words. If the themes are concealed by the limit situations and thus are not clearly perceived, the corresponding tasks, people's responses in the form of historical action can be neither authentically nor critically fulfilled. Ferry defines the fundamental theme of our epoch as one of domination and its opposing theme of liberation. Essentially, this theme of domination presupposes the elimination of dehumanizing oppression. It is absolutely necessary to surmount the limit situations in which people are reduced to things. Ferry claims that the generative theme contained in the minimum thematic universe should be investigated through the method of conscientizasau, critical consciousness. In the footnote on this page, 
Ferry critiques how some individuals in the middle classes fear of freedom leads them to erect defense mechanisms and rationalizations which conceal the fundamental, emphasize the fortuitous, and deny concrete reality. Ferry states, in the face of a problem whose analysis would lead to the uncomfortable perception of a limit situation, their tendency is to remain on the periphery of the discussion and resist any attempt to reach the heart of the question. The method of Conjentisisel maintains the binary of concrete and abstract reality, wherein the people engage in a dialectical decoding of a concrete existential coded situation. The subject recognizes himself and the object, the coded concrete existential situation, and recognizes the object as a situation in which he finds himself, together with other subjects. If a group which does not concretely express a generative thematics, it suggests a dramatic theme, the theme of silence. The theme of silence suggests a structure of mutism in face of the overwhelming force of the limit situations. Ferry continues, stating, themes exist in people in their relations with the world with reference to concrete facts thus including the people as investigators in the search for their own meaningful thematics is crucial. The investigation of themes cannot be reduced to a mechanical act. He says, the investigation will be most educational when it is most critical, and most critical when it avoids the narrow outlines of partial or focalized views of reality and sticks to the comprehension of total reality. Exploring the links between themes and a concern to pose these themes as problems and a concern for their historical cultural context is the goal of liberating education. The investigation of thematics involves the investigation of the people's thinking, thinking which occurs only in and among people together seeking out reality. I cannot think for others or without others, nor can others think for me. Ferry states. He continues, reflection upon situationality is reflection about the very condition of existence, critical thinking by means of which people discover each other to be in a situation. Ferry states, humankind emerge from their submersion and acquire the ability to intervene in reality as it is unveiled. Intervention in reality, historical awareness itself, thus represents a step forward from emergence and results from the conscientiza cell of the situation. Conscientiza cell is the deepening of the attitude of awareness characteristic of all emergence. The task of the dialogical teacher and an interdisciplinary team working on the thematic universe revealed by their investigation is to represent that universe to the people from whom she or he first received it and represent it not as a lecture, but as a problem, he claims. Ferry gives the example of a group of people engaging in a literacy campaign in a post-literacy phase, which details the investigation process followed by them. During the former stage, problem-posing education seeks out and investigates the generative word. In the post-literacy stage, it seeks out and investigates the generative theme, he explains. They follow this potential process. Determine the area where the investigators plan to work through research and contacts. Make initial contact with interested individuals from that area. Identify any risks and explain the purpose of the investigation to those individuals. Visit the area and act as sympathetic observers. Set their critical aim on the area under study regarding the area in its totality as well as consider the smaller aspects that influence it. The decoding stage, in which the investigators record everything in their notebooks, such as the inhabitants' language, their lifestyle, behavior, daily activities, and how they communicate when at work and at play. Hold evaluation meetings to share observations in order to reconsider, through the considerations of others, their previous consideration. Address and resolve any contradictions in which constitute limit situations, involve themes, 
and indicate tasks. In doing so, they try to identify real consciousness, which implies the impossibility of perceiving the untested feasibility which lies beyond the limit situations and potential consciousness. Unperceived practicable solutions. Our untested feasibility. In contrast to perceived practicable solutions and presently practiced solutions. Ferry outlines how careful the investigators should be in addressing and presenting unfamiliar themes to the participants in the beginning of their interaction. In this sense, it is a matter of perception and how the participants, in the process of decoding the themes, began to see how they themselves acted while actually experiencing the situation they are now analyzing, and thus reach a perception of their previous perception. Once participants are stimulated by the previous perception and knowledge of the previous knowledge, decoding stimulates the appearance of a new perception and the development of new knowledge. This, then, leads to an educational plan which transforms the untested feasibility into testing action, as potential consciousness supersedes real consciousness. The methodology that Ferry presents here involves a participant's interaction as much as possible, as well as measuring their level of interest during the discussion stage. Ferry credits a young Chilean civil servant in a governmental institution known as the Instituto de Nazariano Agropecuario, INDAP, as a great contributor to recognizing the reactions and level of involvement during the discussion stage, and by means of the dialectics between the essential and the auxiliary codifications, he has managed to communicate to the participants a sense of totality. An important aspect in Ferry's methodology when interacting with participants is to listen to them about their issues, rather than lecturing to them how to be more virtuous. Ferry describes then how the themes, once decoded by the investigation circles, should be classified according to the various social sciences that they fall under. In this sense, it is an interdisciplinary approach in breaking down each theme identified and then written up to provide aid for training the teacher students who will work in the culture circles. Ferry also mentions unidentified themes, which he calls hinged themes, that may either facilitate the connection between two themes in the program unit, filling a possible gap between the two, or they may illustrate the relations between the general program content and the view of the world held by the people. He continues discussing how the themes are totalities, and once they are broken down and examined, the codification process attempts to retotalize the disjoint theme in the representation of existential situations. After the thematics have been codified, Furry describes how the instructional materials are to be created and used. The important aspect of Freire's methodology is transparency of the specialists working in the culture circles, which includes divulging their background information to the participants. Freire suggests an inquiry-based approach to reading and discussing magazine articles, newspapers, and book chapters, in which questions are presented to the people in order to make them think about the content critically. Once again, Ferry emphasizes the importance of people being aware of the themes present in reality in order to engage in problem posing or inquiry based learning. Ferry concludes the important thing from the point of view of libertarian education is for the people to come to feel like masters of their thinking by discussing the thinking and views of the world explicitly or implicitly manifest in their own suggestions and those of their comrades. Because this view of education starts with the conviction that it cannot present its own program, but must search for this program dialogically with the people. It serves to introduce the pedagogy of the oppressed, in the elaboration of which the oppressed must participate.